Okay, we'd like to uh, uh, just begin the uh, lecture for today, uh, April the 22nd, for logic design. And we're going to cover um, we're going to cover uh, oh I see I'm sticking getting into that oh okay uh, we're going to cover the uh, chapter 15 now um, so let me bring that up and I'll shrink me down here we go and we'll shrink me down. All right, now we're going to cover uh, state reduction and state assignment, which are two parts, just two parts of the process of doing sequential design. Now, when we do sequential design, and let me just review the parts, uh, I might even ask you a question about this on the quiz after the lecture, so you should, you know, maybe make a note here. The, the, the process is, typically we do a state graph first. Uh, later on, I'll show you how to do state machine charts, which are very similar to state graphs, but they're a lot more powerful and useful. And, and I, uh, we, But the good news is uh, that if you practice with state graphs, uh, it's an easy transition to state machine charts. And um, so state graphs are still very useful, good way to think through problems and then whatever. All right, so we're going to do a state graph first. That's typically, for the problems that we're doing at this level, that's reasonable. For really complicated problems, uh, you might want to wind up with a with a state table first, possibly, um, and the state graph might be too cumbersome. Um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> so so there you have it. Uh, redundant. Uh, so uh, once you get your state chart done, and then you you can copy the information straight from your or, sorry from your state graph. You can copy that straight to your um, to your state table, and uh, the state table is very much kind of like a truth table. Only we're dealing with present state and next states, so it, it involves transitions, and it also it, it, all the states uh, have a, a purpose; they mean something, and and in and in that sense, uh, we have to have enough of them to capture the whatever it is of the problem that we need to be remembering. Okay, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, having said that, once you get your state table done, then... Stupid thing, let me just check this real quick. Okay, sorry, back. Um, I, I don't know, I'm gonna turn this phone into vibrate because I, it just drives me crazy. Okay. All right. So anyway, um, so here's what we're going to talk about. Two things. Once you get your state table done, then you can reduce the number of states. And once you get the number of states reduced, then you do a flip-flop state assignment, which then you can substitute in the coding for each state based on some number of flip-flops. And once you do that, now you've turned your state table into a transition table. And uh, that, that transition table then, uh, you, can, uh, you can then from the transition table, you can, you can either do your equations or k-maps or some way. K-maps can uh, simplify your, your logic equations and then you can implement uh, your logic equations in hardware. So that's, that's kind of the process. And, and um, so again, to review the steps, state graph, state table, we reduce the state table, then we do st flip-flop state assignment, then we have a transition table, then we do the k-maps, and then we uh, simplify the expressions and generate the hardware. So that's it. That's all there is to logic design. And the only complicated part about that is really the where you create the original state graph and you figure out what is the flow uh, from one state to another, what's the information that has to be remembered, and um, what is it, how many how many different uh, states is it going to take to fully implement what you want to do? Okay, so with that, uh, we're we're now going to talk about how you reduce the states once you get a state table, and then and then some guidelines for state assignment. All right, so to reduce a state table, the fundamental concept here is uh, t two fundamental concepts. One is uh, we can we can reduce, uh, we can eliminate redundant states, and then we can also 
eliminate equivalent states. Now, the redundant state elimination process only applies to certain problems. And these are problems where we read in some fixed number of inputs and then reset. So like we read in 4, reset, read in 4, or read in 8 and reset, or read in 16 or whatever, read in 5, whatever it is, we read in some fixed number and we reset. That's the classic example where we can use uh, the uh, redundant state elimination. And so let's do this. Uh, we'll give a couple examples. Here, here is an example from the book. Uh, it's 15.1. Uh, and in this example, normally we use letters to represent our flip-flops, but here they use letters to represent states. Normally we use the states, we use S0, S1, S2, but they didn't do that here. The book did it this way. Why, I don't know. It drives me crazy, but anyway, here we are. So, um, so the present state here, the next states for uh, X is 0 or X is 1, and the outputs. Now, just looking at that, you should be able to tell me whether this is a mealy or a more uh, state table. And the correct answer is mealy, because we have uh, two different columns for our output, depending on the next input of X. And so, because that's the case, we, we immediately know this represents a mealy network. If it were more, given a state, the output is determined. And it doesn't depend on the next x input. It's always based on the current state. OK. Now, in this case, the first thing you do is you, you look down here at, at uh, any state that has the same next states and the same outputs for both x is 0 and x is 1. So do you see any, any place where we have the same outputs and the same next states? Well, yes. Obviously for state H and I. Now what about J? Well, no, J's got a problem because it has an output of 1 here. But K is, the next states are A and A and 0, 0, just like in H and I. And so for M, N, and P. So M, N, P, and K and I are all redundant. They're the same as H, so we can replace all of them with H. We don't need these other states. So, so we eliminate them. Now, we can also, uh, let's see, uh, oh. All right, now, you can also look and see that J has outputs, next states of A and A, and outputs of 0, 1, just like L. So we can obviously also eliminate L and replace it with J. Oops. Now that we've done that, we what what is the next step? Well, we've eliminated uh, essentially I and then K, L, M, N, and P. So anywhere I are, here's an I, here's a K, L, M, N, P, anywhere those show up up here, we have we can replace them with either H or J. So if if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's K, M, N, or P, we can replace them with H and also I. And and then in the case of uh, L, we can replace it with J. So let's do that. So we place the I with H, the K with H the N with H, the M with H, the P with H, and then we, we replace the L with J. Now that we've done that, we inspect this whole thing again, and we try and make sure that, uh, that now there may be some new opportunities. So uh, we look at this. Do you see any place where we now have the same next states and the same outputs once we've replaced these uh, redundant states with H and J. Well, so here we have D, H, H, and 0, 0. And here we have G, H, H, and 0, 0. And here we have E, J, H, 0, 0, and F, J, H, 0, 0. So it looks like we've got, we can replace F with E and G with D. So we do that now. Oops. The, those two, and we put in the replacements, E and D. So now that we have this, we look again. 
now that we've made some changes, are, is there any place else where we have the same next dates and the same outputs? And no, it, it doesn't look like there, there are any other opportunities. So now we have our, we have eliminated redundant states because in this case we have a problem. We get in, uh, we get in one, two, three inputs and we reset. One, two, three, reset. One, two, three, reset. So it's a type of problem that fits uh, the description of what you can do when you eliminate redundant states. Now, um, the, uh, so the, this is, redundant states are just the simplest case of equivalent states, okay? Uh, and it, this is unique to the case where the circuit resets after a fixed number of inputs, and we can drop these uh, before we can do, uh, before we can consider equivalent states. We can also eliminate uh, these equivalent states with what's called an impl impl implication table. So, <clears throat> all right, so the first way to reduce states, eliminate uh, redundant states in problems that input a fixed number of uh, variables and then reset. Okay, so um, we did do an example uh, where we had two targets and we kind of just inspected it uh, from chapter uh, 14, it was 14.3, and uh, we just kind of eyeballed it and figured out how to reduce it. Uh, but we can do the same thing here. So here was our original nine state solution. Do you see any states here that have the same next states and the same outputs? So let's see. So it looks like S3 has 0, 0 and an output of 0, 1. And here, S6, 0, 0 and an output of 0, 1. And then anything else? So, so let's see, uh, so S8 has 0, 0, but it has an output of 0, 0. Is there any other case of that? Um, no, it doesn't look like it. Uh, so, so we go ahead and we elim eliminate, um, let's see, I think uh, 5 and 2. Yeah, 5 and 2. Yeah, so... Five and two. Oh, I don't know. I, this is confusing because it's already got changes in it. So we can eliminate these two and replace them uh, five and six with uh, two and uh, three, I think. Yeah. All right. So, so that that so we could have solved that problem without having to actually sit there and inspect it and figure it out. We we just could have uh, used our re, uh, eliminating redundant states technique. Um, sorry, that was confusing, and it's still confusing me. Um, so, the original was. I don't know. I'm, it is confusing to me. Seven two two seven seven five. I don't know. Anyway, well, I marked it up, and now it's really confusing me. But anyway, that. So, let's now look at how we would use an a an, 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 an implication table. Um, so. Well, let me go back and fix this other problem because I I know that was confusing, and I I don't want to leave us there. All right, let's let's see if we can go through this. Um, all right. So the original table. Uh, if we go back to the previous chapter, um, and I think that's 14, no, let's see. Okay, let me, so let me shrink this one down. Yeah, 14. Yeah, so if I go back, if, if I go here and I eliminate, and I get rid of this for a second, and I go ahead and I do, uh, I go back, so if I go back to chapter 14 here, uh, and we, um, sorry. So, so we got we did this. So this was the problem we did. If you remember, we had two targets, zero one zero one and one zero zero one. We input four variables, and and once we input the four variables, then we reset. And so we did it like this. We there's one target. There's the other target. We trace down these uh, these two paths like this, for the one target, and then the path over here for the other target, and then we filled in. The, filled in where we didn't get targets. And so that was, we had to do some extra nodes here to fill these in. 
because we again we have to take four values in even if we're not going to get a target uh, so as soon as we know we're not going to get a target we don't get we don't get to reset then we still have to input all four values and then reset all right so we looked at this and we noticed that s6 and s3 were identical okay and so they both they both uh output a uh they both uh sorry they both output a one on a one and uh, on either a zero or one we go back to s zero and then we also noticed that um, five and uh, two are also very similar. So five and two and six and three. All right, so now let's go back to the other problem uh, that we just did. And we'll bring that back up. All right, now, so five and two and six and three. So five, so five and two. So the original five and two. Yeah, okay, so the, this is the change. So the original five was uh, was S3 and S8, and two was S3 and S8. So that's why we could substitute in then anywhere we had a, a five, we could put a two in, like here. And then, oh, but before we got to that, we had to do this. Okay, so the first substitution we could do was uh, six and uh, five and eight, right? Yeah, five and eight. Oh, sweet grief. Uh, no. Um, so the first one we could do was S6 and two, S6 and S2. I don't know. I, this is still confusing me. Anyway, uh, okay, let me bring this other one up. I swear I am really pulling out my hair okay so the two that were the same were six and three and five and two six and three right these are the same so six and three are the same so we eliminate six and anywhere we have a six we put in a three like here so it was originally six we put in a three and I don't think there's any others. All right. And then when we did that, now we can see that 5 is S3, S8, and 2 is S3, S8. So now we can eliminate 5. So anywhere we have a 5, we can put in a 2. Okay. So that's how that worked. So we eliminate, uh, we el we eliminate uh, 6 and uh, we eliminate, um, we eliminate six and three six and three so we eliminate six substitute it in and now we can eliminate five so we plug in five so that's how we got down that's how you did it okay all right very good okay now we're going to go to the implication uh, table okay so the implication table is uh it's this funny kind of uh a checkerboard sliced on the diagonal so here's another problem. This is unrelated to anything we've looked at so far, just completely unrelated problem. All right. So we have, again, in this case, little letters for states, not S1, S2, S3, but little letters, or S0, S1, S2. And, uh, and so here they are. <clears throat> we have state A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. And then we have next states, D, C for A, F, H, and so forth, and these are the outputs. Now, just looking at this, you should be able to tell whether this is a more or a mealy uh, problem. And if you said more, you're correct because there's only one output column. It doesn't depend on X. The next state depends on X, but not the output. The outputs are, are hard, hard linked to the state. Okay, now the way this works is we, we, put, we want to compare every state to every other state, but not to itself. So for instance, we, we don't want to compare A to A, so we don't put A here. We put B, C, D, E, F, G, H here, and A, B, C, D, E, F, G here. So we leave H off at the bottom and A off the top, off the side because we don't need to compare our states to themselves. So now we compare A to B. We compare B to C, D, E, F, G, H. We compare C to D, E, F, G, H, and so forth. And it works out by doing it this way that we're comparing all the states uh, one time to other states. 
Okay, here, so we compare H to A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. We compare G to A, B, C, D, E, F, and uh, we also compare G to H here. So we don't do it again here. So here you see we compare G and H, but here we don't compare G to H again, and so forth. So that's why it looks like it does. It's a little bit funny. Notice we compare B to A here, and then we compare B to H, G, F, E, D, and C. So we basically compare it to everything, but we don't compare B to itself. And so, so this is how we set the table up. We leave, off one, we leave off the first variable here, and we leave off the last variable there. Now, what, what we're saying is, uh, if, we draw this, if we draw this out, and let me, uh, let me switch here to uh, change. And we'll spread this. Uh, I'm making it bigger, I think, like this. I'm not going to do the whole screen. Okay, well, whatever. It's a little spastic. All right. Okay. So, so here's our chart. So uh, the original problem then. We have uh, we have um, so we have um, a b we have b c d so b through h on the side. Here I'm going to put this back here. Oops, wrong one there. So so we have so here's our little chart. Okay, we're going we're all the way down here and all the way up, not quite to the top. Okay. Okay, so we'll do we'll do the implementation the implication chart here. So we're gonna do this. So we're gonna do uh, B B uh, B down the side. So B C D E F G H. And then across the bottom, we're gonna do A B C D, E, F, G. All right, now the way this works, Okay, now there's the chart. Now, what we're saying then is when we compare A to B, we're saying then that that can only be true if if, if A, A and B are taken to be the same, that can only be true if D equals C and F equals H. Okay, D equals C and F equals H. So, so I'm going to write that in the smaller. So D equals C, F equals H. Okay? Now, and we go through. So then we're going to compare. Uh, then we're going to compare. Uh, the next one, we're going to compare A to C. So A, to, A would be equal to C. A would be equal to C if D equals E and C equals D and of course also that the outputs are the same now in this case it's obvious A and B the outputs are the same so they could possibly be equivalent but A and C don't have the same outputs so without even without even thinking about it we can we can immediately cross that out we don't even have to look at that all right and then we just keep going how about B how about A and D well, A and D have the same output. So A and D will be equivalent if A equals D and C equals E, or E equals C. Notice A and D, that's the question we're already asking, right? We're comparing A to D. 
So we so we don't need to. That's redundant. We don't have to write that in. But but C and E we do have to write in, and they have to be the same. So we'll write that in. C equals E. If that's true, then they may be equivalent. All right, and then we keep going. Uh, e and E and A can't work because they have different outputs. F and A can't work. G and A. So for G and A, B has to equal D, and H has to equal C. So B has to equal for uh, for G and A. Uh, sorry, for G and for G and A, D has to equal B. D equals B, and uh, H has to equal C, or C equals H, something like that. All right, so now we keep going. Obviously, H can't work, so we can cross that out, and we can cross out uh, cross out the other ones. All right, now, the next row, B and C, they have different outputs, but B and D are possibilities. So if B and D are the same, they both have an output of, one, uh, of zero. So F has to equal A, and H equal E. All right, so we'll write that down. So, uh, so now we're going to look at so B and C uh, had different outputs, so we cross that out. But B and D have the same output as zero. So, uh, so if B is equal to D, then A equals F, and um, H equals H equals E. All right, and then then uh, we can look at B and E, but B and E have different outputs uh, because B has a zero output and E has a one, so that can't work. And B and F, different outputs. G and B are possibilities. So if that's true, uh, then uh, B equals F and, oh, sorry, uh, G and B, G and B, G and B, G and B, yeah, sorry, G and B, B equals F, so B equals F and uh, H equals H, well, H does equal H, so we don't even have to worry about that, so that's okay, and, uh, and then H and B, H and B uh, have different outputs, so that's not going to work. All right, now we do C and D. Uh, C and D have different outputs, right? Yes. So they can't be they can't be equivalent. C and E possible. Uh, C if that's true, E equals C. Well, that's the same thing. Or C equals E. C equals E. Well, we already know that. That's what we're testing. It may not be true, but that's what we're testing. So we don't have to write it in. And uh, and then uh, H. Sorry, D and A. So A equals D. And then F and uh, F. Uh, oh yeah, so that was E and F, right? E and F. So F and C. Comparing F and C, they. Uh, so if we go back to this, compare F and C. So here's C and here's F. So if F equals C, E equals F, and D equals B. So E equals F, E equals F, and, and that is F and C equals F, and D equals B, and D equals B. Okay, and then C and G. C and G uh, have different outputs, and C and H also possible. So C and H so E equals C, and uh, G equals D, right? All right, G equals D. All right, and then basically we can just keep going. Now, what happens is once we fill out the entire chart, and I guess I'll just, here, I'll just go ahead and fill the rest of it out without walking through everything. So, uh, so compare D and E. D and E, uh, different outputs. D and F, different outputs. D and G, possible. And D and H, different outputs. So let's compare D and G. Uh, D and G 
So A has to equal B, A equals B, and uh, E equals H, E equals H. And then E, uh, so uh, E and F possible. So for E and F, uh, C equals F, C equals F, and uh, A equals B. All right, and then E and G can't be, and E and H, E and H, C equals C, so that's redundant, so that's okay. And, uh, and then E and H, uh, A and G, A equals G. And then F, uh, F is a, uh, F and G, different outputs, so that can't work. F and H, possible. So that would be F equals C and uh, B equals G. And then finally G and H, can't be. All right, so now we've done it. Now we fill out the whole chart. Now what we do, let's go back. What about A and B? Well, do, is it possible that D equals C? Well, let's see, here's D and C. No, they, they already can't be equal, so we already know that is gone because D and C don't, won't work. Okay, what about C and E? C and E. So C and E, it is possible, so we can't cross that one out. What about uh, D and B? D and B. Uh, let's see, D and B. Here's B and D. Possible. So that's possible. What about C and H? C and H, also possible, so we can't cross that out yet. Uh, and then, uh, then uh, how about this column? Uh, a and F, so here's A and F, that's already crossed out, so can't work. And then B and F, B and F, already crossed out, so that can't work. And then what about A and D? A and D, possible so we can't cross that out yet uh, E and F so E and F E and F uh, E and let's see E and F E and F it's possible uh, what about uh, D and B uh, D and B is crossed out so this one's gone and then what about E and C so E and C uh, C E and C it's possible. And what about G and D? G and D, also possible. So we have to leave that. Uh, and then what about, um, um, where were we? Uh, e and C and G and D. Okay, we were here. Okay, now D, D, A and B, A and B crossed out, so that one's gone. What about uh, E and F? So A and F, A and F crossed out, so that one's gone. What about A and G? A and G, possible. What about uh, F and H? Right, so F equals C, F and C. Nope, that one's gone. All right, so now you see we've crossed out a bunch of stuff. The only ones we have left, we have, we have, we have that one left, we have this one left, we have this one left, we have that one left, and that one. Okay, so let's go back and look at the ones that are left. All right, C and E. C and uh, E, still possible. All right, how about D and B? D and B, D and B is now crossed out, so we're done, that one's gone. How about uh, E and C, E and C, so that requires A and D, A and D, still possible, okay? And then what about uh, E and C, E and C? Uh, yeah, E and C. So that's still E and C. That is still possible. And what about G and D? G and G and D. It's crossed out. So now this one's gone. And then uh, what about A and G? A and G. It's crossed out. So this one's gone. So everything's gone except these two. Now let's look again. What about C and E? C and E is possible. And what about... Uh, uh, so A and D might be might be okay, and then what about uh, C and E? Well, that's A and D. 
So that's still possible. So at this point, then we we conclude that uh, that DNA that that D can that A that D can equal A, and that uh, that C could equal E. That those are those are those are our uh, uh, equivalent states. And so we we can substitute in. Anywhere we have D, we can put in A. Anywhere we have E, we can put in C. And we can eliminate D and E. So that's how that works. All right, so that's a little bit tedious, but hopefully uh, hopefully that was helpful to go through it. All right, now I'm going to shrink this down, and we're going to move on. So equivalent state assignments. Okay, so a big part of Chapter uh, 15 is spent talking about this this thing called equivalent state assignments. Now I'm going to try and explain that. So if you look at uh, how you let's say you have a problem with three states or a problem with four states. It turns out that there are um, that there are uh, 24 different ways to assign states to a three or four state problem with two flip-flops. You have two flip-flops so you can assign them 0 0 for state uh, 1. For S, or for S0, you can assign it 0, 1 for S1, 1, 0 for S2, and 1, 1 for S3 if you're doing four states, okay? Straight binary order. It also turns out that, that there are 23 other ways you can do that. Uh, but of those, of all the 24 ways you can assign those states, only three of them result in a summation of different hardware. So, even though there's 24 different ways, the hardware moves around, but you don't decrease the amount of hardware, except there are three non-equivalent non -equivalent, uh, amounts of hardware. And, and now what that is for any particular problem could vary tremendously. But, but the book spends a lot of time trying to sort of prove this concept of, of, of that we don't have to look at all 24 possibilities, we only really have to look at three possibilities, and that will tell us uh, for a three-state or a four-state problem, if there is a min if there's one of those choices, would give us the least amount of hardware possible. And and of that, there are other other assignments that could give us the same least amount, but but there's nothing that would give us less than that. Okay, so so we call these we call these um, we essentially call these um, non-equivalent assignments, okay? Because if the amount of hardware, even though you you might say move it around, uh, instead of for the A flip-flop, it would be on the B flip-flop, uh, but the amount of hardware would be the same, then then we call these non-equivalent, uh, then, then we call these equivalent assignments because they don't result in less hardware. So there's only three non-equivalent assignments. And, and so I suggest you sort of commit these to memory because they're really easy. So here they are. Uh, you can do the four state and you just ignore the last row. Don't worry about the three state. It's exactly the same essentially. So the the three three ways to consider there are three non-equivalent assignments and here they are. Uh, the first one is binary order. 0, 1, 2, 3. The next one is 0, 1, 3, 2. And the next one is 0, three, one, two. So you just take the th this third assignment, assignment three, and you move it up like this on the diagonal. So here it's in binary order. Here you flip the bottom rows, and here you flip this up, and then the bottom rows are still in order. The two bottom rows are in order. So those are the three non-equivalent assignments for three state and four state. Now, here's the problem. If you go to, uh, and, and I always, uh, I should put this in I, I'm going to do this in one of the slides. I'm going to I'm going to add this right now because I always have needed to do this, and I'm just going to add a slide right here. So let's kill this, and then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to add. Yeah, so I'm going to add a slide, and um, So I'm going to add this picture from the book, 
and now I just need to go here and Pluto and down here oh I think I may have it already here I do so I'll put it over here so you can see it so if we go in the book and we go to chapter 15 and then uh, actually I'll go from the back and go forward uh, see if I can find it without having to look forever yeah, here we go. This, this is the picture I want right here. And I think I'll just have to do a, a snapshot. And then I'll go back to here to the PowerPoint. All right, now. All right, and then we'll bring this up. Okay, and then we'll bring the camera back up. All right, here we go. Now, if you look at this, these are the number of distinct or non-equivalent assignments. So for two and for two states, there's only one. So you, there's no reason to even think about it. For three states or four states, it's exactly the same three non-equivalent assignments. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 3, 2, and 0, 3, 1, 2. Those are it. That's all there are. But for four, uh, sorry, for five, there are 140 non-equivalent assignments. For six, there's eight, there's 420. For seven and eight, there's 840. For nine, there is 10 million. It's just explodes. It's like the traveling salesman problem. The number of possible ways to do the routes through, you know, through a few cities, it just becomes immediately so large that, that you can't brute force it. And, uh, and these are the kind of problems that we'd like to think that, uh, that uh, we, might, we might be able to get quantum computing to solve for us. But uh, the problem with that is we have to figure out how to shrink it to the solution we're interested in and not just a random solution. Uh, so that's the problem with quantum computing. All right, and then here you have for 16 states, 5.5 times 10 to the 10th. I mean, a humongous number. So you can see uh, that uh, that and and this is and this is the minimum number of state variables, which means the minimum number of flip flops. So you, you take three bits to represent uh, five states, six states, and seven states. Uh, in eight states, it takes four bits for nine. Once you get into four bits, you're just off the charts. And uh, it's bad enough with just three. Uh, okay, so, so that's the problem. So since you can only really explore all the possibilities for a three-state or four-state problem, or, you know, and nothing else, really 140, you could do that in, in a pinch if you really had to, but uh, for five, but six would be really challenging and seven and eight would probably be just unworkable okay so so here so here you have well maybe you could get a computer program to do it but anything more than that it gets really unwieldy so rather than brute force it what we do instead is we have uh we we have some rules and we use the rules okay so so we can only it's only possible to check all uh all well all non-equivalent assignments for smallest number of states. I should say non-equivalent here. I don't know why I put that wrong. Okay, and uh, for larger number of states, uh, we have to use guidelines. And we use this concept of adjacent uh, assignments. So. We'll talk about, we'll explain that in a second. But what it means is they only differ by a single variable. Um, okay, it's just like it's just like in a four variable K-map, any two boxes that are horizontally or vertically connected only differ by one bit. Same idea in this adjacent assignment thing. All right, so um, the when we have an incompletely specified state table, uh, where we have states with don't cares, then we definitely can use the don't cares uh, 
to help reduce the number of states. Um, so, all right. And then we have one other issue, this one hot state assignment. And then I'm going to go through the, uh, the, the guidelines. Uh, I thought I had those on the, on the slides. Yeah, I do. Okay. So one hot state, well, let me do the guidelines. We'll come back to one hot. So here are the guidelines for state assignment if you're going to assign the, the, use the minimum number of flip-flops. So let's say you're going to have, let's say you have uh, 10 states. So how many flip-flops, what's the minimum number of flip-flops? Well, it, from, uh, as, long as, you, as long as you don't have more than 16 states, you can do four bits, right? Four flip-flops would work fine. Uh, so... So, the, so here are the guidelines. So states that have the same next states should have what's, what are called the JSON assignments. So their flip-flop encoding should only differ by one bit. States that are the next states of the same states should have assignments that differ by only a single bit. And then if you want to minimize the output equations, you can do states with the same output should have adjacent assignments. And normally, we actually use a KMAP to do these assignments. Uh, if if we don't have more than uh, say four flip flops, uh, so once you have over sixteen, then it gets a little unwieldy. <coughs> um, and so let me explain how to do that. Uh, I'll show you here. We'll put this back up, and let me grab a new sheet of paper, and then we'll be done. All right. So so let's do a little K map here. So let's say we have flip-flops A, B, C, and D, and we're gonna and we're gonna assign those to we're gonna assign. Let's say we have a problem with uh, with say uh, let's say we have uh, ten states. So we have we have S zero through S nine, okay, and we have flip-flops A, B, C, D. All right, now. If we followed those, so we'd, we'd look at our state table and we'd see, well, let's, what are some states that have the same next states? Well, so, we, you know, so you have to look at the truth table to do that. But let's say for sake of argument that, uh, let's say for sake of argument that S0 and S1 and S2 all had the same next states. All right. Um, so, uh, uh, so we would then we'd want to have them adjacent. So uh, you could put them anywhere, but let's we'll say S zero here, S one there, and then S two here. So now they're all they're but now you can't have them all three adjacent because S two is not adjacent to S one, but it is S zero. So you could put S two down here, or you could put it down here. But there's no way to get uh, there's no way to have three boxes that are all adjacent, right? To each other. Um, let's say that, so that would be rule number one. Now, let's say we, uh, let's say we go back to, uh, oh, I see. So, so that states with the same next state. Let's say, let's say in our truth table for say state, uh, for state four, state four had next states of, uh, of um, seven and six, okay? So state four has next states of seven and six. We'll just kind of make this up. So so S4 has states of S7 and S6. Then we'd want to have six and seven have adjacent assignments. So over here we do S6 and S7. And again, you just basically fill in the chart following those rules moving things around. So if we put them in adjacent squares, we know they only differ. So then when we're all said and done, how do we figure this out? Well, so the coding for state S0 would be would be A equals 0, B equals 0, C equals 0, and D equals 0. For S1, it would be A equals 0, B equals 0, C equals 0, and D equals 1. And for S2, it would be, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so it would be A equals 0, B equals 1, C equals 0, and D equals 0. So you can see they only differ by a single variable. These are all zeros. These, uh, these differ by two variables, but this one only differs by one from S0. Because again, 
S1 and S S1 and S0 only differ by 1, S2 and S0 only differ by 1, but S1 and S2 do differ by 2, obviously. All right, so that's that's sort of the explanation. And then, then you can also um, do try and follow the same rules uh, for outputs. Uh, you kind of do this last because that's maybe less critical in some ways. All right, so that's, that's how you apply these guidelines. Now, let's talk about one hot state assignment. So sometimes... Uh, particularly when we're designing with uh, with FPGAs and even CPLDs, we have extra flip flops hanging around. They're just part on they're on the chip already. They're there. We can use them or not. And uh, so there's there's maybe no reason to do the minimum number of flip flops to encode our state in our state machine. We can we can use a different technique where we where if we have four states we use four flip flops. If we have five states we use five, and we set it up so that so that uh, kind of like this down here. For S0, then uh, flip-flop A is 1, and all the rest are 0. For S1, flip-flop B is 1, and all the rest are 0. For 2, C is 1, and for 3, D is 1, and all the rest are 0. It turns out when we do this, it does actually, it can actually help us to simplify some of our, uh, some of our uh, logic, because we only have, we know that all the other values are 0. We can, we can, we can assume that we know that they won't play into it. That it will never be the case that our flip-flops will be anything other than this value, this value, this value, or this value, because we only have four states, say, in this case. And so uh, there'll never be one, one, zero, one, or any other variable. So we can, so we can use that fact to our advantage, and we can let the A flip-flop drive stuff when it's one, when it's zero, then it can won't drive it, and that means we're not in state S0 anymore. And here, uh, when B is 1, then we know we're in S1. And when B is not 1, you're not in S1. So it actually can allow you to simplify your logic uh, because you have a lot of don't cares. Um, and, and you only have ones where uh, for one flip-flop at a time. So we call this one hot state assignment. And it is, it, it is a, uh, it's particularly helpful in when you're using uh, programmable logic devices because you usually have extra flip-flops. Now, if you had to add a bunch of extra flip-flops, now you are adding hardware to your problem. So saving a gate or two here or there really probably isn't worth the extra flip-flops. But when you already have them, then that can actually be helpful and, and it may speed things up. All right, I think that's all I really wanted to say. Um, uh, uh, I did work through a problem and maybe Friday I'll talk about that. I worked through, um, or maybe I'll talk. Maybe I'll talk about it briefly. Briefly right now. So I did do. I did do a little problem um, on the help session, which, uh, by the way, uh, I'm sorry about late notice. I'm. I think I'm going to do another help session on Friday, maybe in the mid afternoon, and I'll send out an email uh, by Thursday night with the link for that. I'd like to see a lot of you show up for that, and then if you want to have help with homework problems, I'll be happy to do it. I can't work through the whole homework problem, but I did I did post on Blackboard, and I'll show you where that is. So let me go over here and get rid of this, and get rid of uh, get rid of this, and um, then let me go on. So the problem that we did was uh, fourteen. It was fourteen six, I think. Yeah, this one right here. This where it says a sequential circuit has two inputs x1 and x2 and one output z. The output begins at zero and remains a constant value until one of the following input sequences occurs. x1 and x2 are 1, 1, and then the next clock cycle they're both zero, which causes the output to become zero. The input sequence x1, x2 is 1, 1, and the next clock cycle 0, 0, which causes the output to become 1. And finally, the input sequence x1, x2 is 1, 0, and the next clock cycle is 0, 0, which causes the output to change value. So drive a more state table. All right, so uh, I put on the, uh, uh, so we're using a more network. I, I did the state table. Let me pull it up off Blackboard. I did put that so you guys can see it. Um, so let's see, here it is. And uh, we're in logic design. And if I go into course content, oh, by the way, I made all the quizzes if you haven't taken them, they're all available. You can take any of the quizzes now. So down in the homework folder, where you're supposed to turn the homework in, here, at the very bottom of that, I put, uh, I put, 
Hmm. Hmm. Well, I thought I did. Oh, it's here. I put it right after the homework it's doing. Solution for 14.6. So if you look at this, it's just a Word document that pops open. And uh, here it is. And so what I want you to see here then is um, So here, so it turns out you need eight states to do this. And uh, so here's our present state. Here's our next state. Here's our output. And this is what each state means, OK? So, so in, we start in S0 where we have nothing. Uh, so we don't have any, con any condition. So remember, if you look at the problem again, Oh, I guess I, did I get rid of it? I guess I did. Shucks. Well, if, if you look at the problem, so, so if you, if you have a zero, a zero, zero, followed by, well, if you have zero, zero, you don't do anything here. Okay. If you have zero, one, then, then that moves us to S1. In S1, we have this condition of zero, one, which means uh, if we get another zero, we're going to make sure the output stays to be zero. And again, remember the output has to stay the same until until it changes by one of these conditions. Um, but in state zero, we have nothing. But if if we get a zero zero, we stay there. If we get a zero one, we'll go to S one, which means we have zero one as our condition. If we get one one, we'll go to S two, which means we have one one as our condition. And if we get one zero, we'll go to S three, which means we have one zero as our condition. Now, if we're in S one and we get zero zero here. Then, then we make sure our output is set to zero, and we go back, and then we go back to S0, which means we have nothing. If, on the other hand, we're in S2, and if we're in S1 and we get any of these other values, a 0, 1, we stay there, a 1, 1, we go to S2, and a 1, 0, we go to S3. Because we didn't get the 0, 0 condition, we don't, it didn't change anything. All right, now we're in S2, which means we've gotten condition 1, 1, which means we're going to set our output to be 1 if we get 0, 0. So here we get a 0, 0. We go to S4, and now our output is 1 right here, but we have nothing. Okay, so it's very similar to the state S0, except our output is a 1. Otherwise, it's all the same. And then in S4, if we get a 0, 0, we'll stay there. A 0, 1 will go to S5. A 1, 1 will go to S6, and a 1, 0 will go to S7. S5, 6, and 7 are essentially identical to 1, 2, and 3, except that in 5, 6, and 7, the output is always a 1. And in 1, 2, and 3, the output is always a 0. When we go, when we go to uh, S2, and, uh, uh, or sorry, when we go to S3, then uh, if, if our, since our output is a 0 and it has to change, that means it's going to go to 1. So now we go to 4. Um, which is basically the same thing as S2. And, and in S4, our output's 1, but we have nothing. All right. So, and, so those are the conditions here. Now, once we're in S4, it's just like S0, only our output's a 1. And if we get a 0, 0, we stay there, because the output's not supposed to change unless we go meet this condition and then get a 0, 0. So if we get a 0, 1, we go to S5, a 1, 1, we go to 6, and a 1, 0, we go to 7. So in 5, our condition is 0, 1. In 6, our condition is 1, 1. And in 7, our condition is 1, 0. Whenever we have a condition of 0, 1, if we get 0, 0, that means our output has to change to 0. So that means we go back to S0, where our output is 0, and we have nothing. If, however, we don't get the double zero, then if we get a one, we'll go to S5, a, a three will go to six, and a two will go to seven, just like we did from S4. But our output stays as a one. If we're in six, where our output stays as a one, then we just go back to, uh, we, if we get a double zero, we just go back to S4, where the output is a one. And if in S4, uh, sorry, if in S6 we get a 0, 1, we go to 5, a 1, 1, we go to 6, and a 1, 0, we go to 7. But the output stays, stays as 1. And then finally, if, if we are in S4 and we, uh, sorry, if we're in S, 
if we get a zero a one zero then we go to seven and if we're in seven with this condition of one zero and we get a zero zero we have to change our output it's now one it has to go to zero so we go to s zero now the output's a zero but we have nothing and we're waiting for the next two, two inputs and if we're in seven and we don't get to double zero then basically we just go to s5 if we get a one s6 if we get one one and we stay here if we get a one zero so that's kind of how this this is but anyway this is the solution so hopefully you can think your way through this and it can make sense since it's a more we always have to have the output associated directly with the state and that that's that's why mores tend to have more states if we did this with melee uh, I don't know. I'm not sure it would help us with the melee, frankly, uh, but maybe a little bit it would. All right, so I just wanted to go through that briefly, but that's, that's there if you want to look at that. All right, we will see you, uh, we will see you then uh, on, uh, I'll do another, I'll do a little quiz and post that, and I'll do another, uh, I'll do another uh, video uh, later in the week. All right, we will talk to you later.